little bit. Okay. I, I've been reading from uh, Canto 2, Chapter 3. So I'm going to do a little background. The, 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 the Srimad Bhagavatam is understood to be a dialogue between Shukadeva Goswami, the speaker, and Maharaj Prikshit, the listener, Shavanam, Kirtanam, Shukadeva Goswami doing the Kirtanam part, the king, Maharaj Prikshit, doing the Shavanam part. And the first canto uh, has 19 chapters, and in the last four chapters of those 19 chapters were introduced to Maharaj Prikshit, who was the posthumous son. Posthumous means he was born after his father died. His, he was conceived in the womb of his mother. His father died. Abhimanyu was his father. Abhimanyu was a great hero. 16-year-old warrior that it took seven generals to kill him during the Kurukshetra battle, which is illegal from Chatriya codes. So Uttara, um, his mother, Uttara was his mother. And Abhiman, so Abhimanyu, little, let's go back a little bit, Abhimanyu was the son of Arjuna and Subhadra. Who's Subhadra? Subhadra is the sister of Krishna Balaram. And Abhimanyu was their son. And uh, when the Pandavas were in the forest incognito for some number of years, the final year, they were staying um, at the in the kingdom as if they were not Kshatriyas, but had different professions. So Arjuna's clandestine profession was a dance teacher. There's a whole Mahabharat. Mahabharat. Do you like stories? Yeah. Okay, so during the the, the 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 arrangement was when the Pandavas lost the gambling match, they were sent to the forest, and for some number of years they were just wandering about in the forest. And then the final year, if they were discovered in the final year, then they have to do another so many years in the forest. So during that final year. They uh, they stayed at the palace of one king, Virat. And each of the five brothers took a different profession, and Draupadi took her profession, and uh, the chief general of King Virat's army, he drew fascination for him. Draupadi. So he was hitting on Draupadi. And she went to Bhima and said, Stop this man. So Bhima made the following plan. Bhima said, Invite him to come see you at night, and I'll be I'll be there, I'll finish him. So he thought, the general thought, this is it. I got through to Draupadi. She wasn't known by that name. He didn't know who she was. But she was fabulously gorgeous. So when he came, he started coming on, and Bhima showed up. And Bhima smashed him to pulp. His bones were all broken. He was like a bag. And threw him out of the palace wall. And his body was found and the core of us figured out this general was so powerful. There's only one person that could possibly do that. That's Bhima. 
the Pandavas are at King Virat's palace. So we just have to show up and discover their whereabouts. And then they'll have to do another so many years in the forest. That was the deal. So they came. Karna and Dushashana and Duryodhana and their armies and their, their plan was that they would attack the cows and the cow herds of King Virat, which would incite the Pandavas. They'd have to go and protect. And then once they had to protect, we'd, we'd discover who they are. So they attacked. And the news went to the king. The king's son said, I'm a hero, I'll go do it. Arjuna, the dance teacher, said, I'll be your chariot driver. So Arjuna's the chariot driver. I forget the son's name. So off they went, and he got you know, beaten badly. The chariot driver, Arjuna, said, I'll take care of this. He went to the sal tree where his quiver and bow were kept. And he said, you be the chariot driver, I'll be the warrior. <laughs> they switched roles. Arjuna defeated the entire corps of army. Fortune had it that um, fortune had it that the time that they were to be in the forest was over. So it was too late. So when, and when Arjuna and the king's son came back, the the king said. I, I owe everything to you. How about you marry my daughter? And he said, I can't marry your daughter because she was my student. This teacher can't marry a student. But I have a son, Abhimanyu, and he's of marriageable age for your daughter. So the marriage was conducted. And King Virat became an ally of the Pandavas and Abhimanyu, who was Arjuna's son, married Uttara. And shortly after that, the Kurukshetra battle began. Abhimanyu was then 16 when he married Uttara. Uttara was pregnant, and Abhimanyu was killed during the battle. S s six or eight generals, I forget. They all ganged up on him and all, because he was so powerful. They shut off his arms, and he still was fighting without his arms. He was a heroic person. They killed him. So Uttara was left with a posthumous child, not yet married in the presence of her husband. So much later, um, towards the end of the battle, one of the Ashvatama was a Brahmin. Ashvatama was the son of, who was the father of Dronachari. Oh, so you know the story. Dronachari was the father. Ashvatama wanted to please Duryodhana so much. He shot a Brahmastra weapon at the womb of Uttara to kill the remaining descendant of the Pandavas. Krishna appeared and checked while still in the womb. Parikshit was protected by Krishna, who checked the force of the Brahmastra, because a Brahmastra is an invincible weapon, except Krishna. Krishna checked it. So from the time of his birth, he was known as Parikshit because he was always searching for that same Lord who he saw still within the womb. That's what his name means, the Parikshit, searcher or examining. Examining. Where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? That's the child. So this is towards the end of the first canto Bhagavatam. And the, 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 the story of Parikshit's life is told over many chapters. He was a great personality. And then, towards the end, in chapter, the last chapter, Prikshit 
by the influence of super soul within his heart, he made a mistake. Made an offense. There was a sage um, whose name was Shamakrishi. He was engaged in meditation in his cottage in the forest. One day when Prikshit was hunting, he became thirsty, overwhelmed with thirst. He went, he saw this cottage, he went to the cottage. The sage didn't even say Haribo. He didn't say hello or how can I serve you? And Prikshit became angry. First, overwhelmed by thirst, that's not Prikshit. He was able to withstand a Brahmastra. And then he became overwhelmed with anger. What kind of sage are you? You can't even receive the king? Offer a seat and some water? So he left in disgust. He saw outside the cottage a dead snake. He picked up the dead snake on the, with the tip of his sword, went back into the cottage, put it around the neck of the king. This is a fitting garland for you. And left. And after doing that, this is 19th chapter of the final canto, the son, he started feeling really badly. Why did I do this? This is offensive. Surely I'm going to get a reaction. And whatever that reaction is, I'll accept it because this was offensive. The son named Shringi, he came back. He heard from the neighbors what happened. The king put this dead snake around his neck and he cursed Marish Prick said, you're going to die within seven days because he knew some mantras. And by misuse of his brahminical power, he cursed Maharaj Prikshit to die in seven days. The news went to Maharaj Prikshit, and Maharaj Prikshit accepted. This is fitting. I made an offense to a brahmana. What a horrible act. And so he decided he would give his kingdom over to his eldest son. Janame Jaya was his son's name. And took off his royal garb and took on the garb of a mendicant, went by the side of the sacred river, invited all the sages to come and instruct him what to do in face of death in seven days. So big, big scene, big description of who, who all was there, everybody was there. And then in comes Shukadeva Goswami. And everyone, because of his spiritual stature, just seeing him, they had never seen him before. They just rose to receive him and honor him. At the end of chapter 19, which is a lead into this canto too, um, Marsh Prikshit honored him and then asked suitable questions, mainly two questions. What's the duty of a person about to die? And what's that subject matter that they should always hear, chant, remember, and worship? Always. And Canto 2 begins, that's what we're reading from. It's Shukadev Goswami is starting to speak. He doesn't speak until the second canto. So he's instructing Maharaj Prikshit in response to his question. And the theme goes like this, keeping it really simple. Chapter one of Canto two is forming a personal conception of God by seeing the features of material nature. Universal form. The hills are as stacks of bones, the trees are as hairs. The eyes are the sun and the moon. It's you know a, a whole description of one of the aspects, one of the depictions of the universal form, which is a very different picture than we find in Bhagavad Gita, chapter eleven. And then, in forming a personal conception of God, engaging in service to Him in His personal feature. Second chapter, move on from there. Once that personal conception is achieved, meditation. 
the Ashtanga Yoga system, Chapter 6, Bhagavad Gita, Ashtanga Yoga system, and then engage, when fixing the mind upon the Supreme, engaging in his service. So service, Chapter 1, service, Chapter 2. Chapter 3 is service. The mature stage is the Bhagavan feature and serving the Bhagavan feature. And that's where we are. After completing those, the answer to those two, and, and always hear about Lord Hari. That's his answer. After hearing that, um, the two persons that were discussing in Canto 1, that Sutta Goswami and the great sage Brigu and the other sages, they resumed their discussion. Oh, this was really, really good. Both Shukadev and Raj Prikshit were exalted persons even from their birth. So the topics they discussed further must have been really fantastic. Can you describe those topics? So it's again, it's topics about Hari and the exalted nature of devotees of the Lord. And t hearing from them is the same as hearing about Hari. So that's where we are. A little background. And the title of the chapter, three, devotional service, pure devotional service, change of heart. So moving from a heart that's uh, immersed in material consciousness, transitioning to a heart that's filled with devotional consciousness. That's very relevant to all of us. And the text is text 21. Now, this, this section... is a compare and contrast model. One of the, in, in the, in methods for teaching, one of the ways to teach about something is to say, this is the something and this is what the something isn't. It's a method of teaching. So, uh, Shukadeva Goswami is doing, using this method of teaching by saying, in material consciousness, it looks like this. And the spiritual, con the change of heart consciousness looks like that. So he, he is encouraging, Shukadeva Goswami is encouraging transition to the spiritual consciousness and leave behind the material consciousness. Because material consciousness looks like, like that instead of like this. So he is, there's several verses in a row where he's saying when the senses are used for a material purpose, it's no better than something that's you know, not very laudable. And then when you use the senses, the body, and the faculties of human consciousness, human form of life, for a spiritual purpose, that's preferred. This change of consciousness is to go there and not to stay in the animal consciousness or the bodily conception consciousness. Okay, so that's the m model. Here's the verse. The upper portion of the body, though crowned with a silk turban, is only a heavy burden, if not bowed down before the personality of Godhead who can award mukti, and the hands, though decorated with glittering bangles, are like those of a dead man if not engaged in the service of the personality of Godhead, Hari. So it's indirect, it's Hari, Kata, but it's speaking about um, using the senses in service to Hari. There's a nice definition. There's, there's two primary definitions of, of Bhakti that um, are given to us. One is given by Narada in the Narada Pancharatra. It's really simple, really short. Um, uh, 
Sarva Upadi Vinir Muktam Vinir Muktam Mukti rejecting the Upadis, which means the designations that I'm American and you're Indian, or I'm male and you're female, or I'm tall and you're short, or whatever, whatever. I'm black and you're white, and something, something. That a conception of self in terms of the body, that's an upadi. It's not who we are. We're the spirit soul. And the other conception is an upadi conception. So sarva upadi, all designations, vinir muktam, leaving aside all bodily conceptions. Tat paratvena nirmalam. Nirmalam means pure. In that purified state of consciousness, rishikena, rishikesha, sevanam. Very simple. Rishikesha is the Lord, the master of the senses. The senses used in service of the master of the senses. Rishikena, rishikesha sevanam. Bhakti Uttama. That's it. That's it. That's the definition. Bhakti, using our senses in the service of the master of the senses without a designation. I'm a this, I'm a that. In terms of the covering. And it can be, you know, subtle. I'm smart, I'm not so smart. I'm wealthy, I'm not so wealthy. I have a high birth, I don't have a high birth, etc., etc. You know, body or, or mind conception, covering conception. Here is the purport. Page and a half. As stated herein before, there are three kinds of devotees of the Lord. The first class devotee does not at all see anyone who is not in the service of the Lord. But the second class devotee makes distinctions between devotees and non-devotees. Not di discriminating in the bad sense, but just discrim discerning in terms of there's a difference between those that are serving and not serving. The second class devotees are therefore meant for preaching work. And, as referred to in the above verse, they must loudly preach the glories of the Lord. That's the previous verse. S -s reciting spiritual sound vibrations loudly so that they will benefit and others will benefit. So, audibly, not just silently or silent meditation, but audibly for the benefit of everyone. The second class devotee accepts disciples from the section of the third-class devotees or non-devotees. Sometimes the first-class devotee also comes down to the category of the second-class devotee for preaching work. But the common man, who is expected to become at least a third-class devotee, is advised herein to visit the temple of the Lord and bow down before the deity. Even though he may be a very rich man, or even a king with a silk turban or crown. The Lord is the Lord of everyone, including the great kings and emperors, and men who are rich in the estimation of mundane people must therefore make it a point to visit the temple of Lord Sri Krishna and regularly bow down before the deity. The Lord in the temple is the worshipable form and is never to be considered to be made of stone or wood. For the Lord, in his archa incarnation, as the deity in the temple, shows immense favor to the fallen souls by his auspicious presence. So let's stop for a moment. The, uh, the archa or the deity form is described this way. Um, our material senses cannot perceive the spiritual form Material senses can't perceive the soul. Material senses can't perceive God. They just don't, it's not, it's not within their capacity. But God being very kind, 
allows himself to be seen by accepting a form that's made of material elements so that persons can see. And the, the teaching is when the deity form is installed, then the deity form is non-different than the form of the Lord. Since we can't see him, he makes himself visible to us with these eyes. And then worldly people think, oh, that's wood or stone or metal. And the, the scriptural understanding is no. Although that form is wood or stone or metal, because the Lord has accepted the invitation to receive our service that way, then the form is not different than the person. Similar to, to give two other examples, similar to the name. There's an important teaching that just like that song we sang at the beginning, they're just it's eight words, they're names of Krishna in Vrindavan, each one of the eight names. And the name, Abhina Tvam Nama Namino, there's a, there's a relationship of Abhina or non-difference between Nama and Nami, means the name and the object named, Nama and Nami, which is not true for material sound. For example, if I say water, 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 the sound and the object are different. In spiritual terms, the sound and the object named are non-different, abhina, tvam, having the quality of non-difference between the name and the object named or the person named. Or another example of scripture. I mean, from, from the Western context, the Holy Bible is, or the Quran, or the, uh, the, the scripture of the Sikhs, the Granta Sahab, they consider that scripture non different than God. The revealed word of God is within the scripture, and therefore it's sacred. Some years ago, um, the Hare Krishna Temple bought a synagogue from a Jewish organization. They get the name of the Jewish organization. The Jewish organization. And they wanted out of that neighborhood because it wasn't a good neighborhood. Their congregation was dwindling because it wasn't a good neighborhood. So they sold. And when we bought the building, we, you know, they had their assembly hall, which we converted into, we took the seats out and just had a kirtan hall, it was nice. And upstairs, above the ground floor, was a place where they had uh, rituals. And the Torah wasn't there anymore, but there, was, there were rows of seats, and then you walk up and there was a plat raised platform, on top of the raised platform was a stanchion, on top of the stanchion was silk wrappers, and that's where they had the Torah, because it was it's sacred, and the rabbi would read from the Torah and, you know, preside over functions that w involved worshiping the holy book. So those are two examples: the name and the holy books, or the word of God, is God. That's a spiritual conception that various religions hold. And the Vedic tradition also holds that the Bhagavad Gita is Krishna's words, and Krishna's words is Krishna. You can't say that about Shakespeare's writings or something else. It, it's not nice writings, but Shakespeare and the writings are different than the writings. But Krishna's words and Krishna are not different. So the, the back to the text here, the the archa or the deity form is especially important for people who are in the bodily conception and need to move, wish to move from the bodily conception to a spiritual conception. So using the faculties of the body, the sense of sight or the sense of touch, 
they can offer lamp and flowers and incense and decorate the deity and so forth and so on for the, the pleasure of the deity. That means they're using their senses and the objects of the senses to worship the Supreme. Deity worship is very practical and it has a spiritualizing effect. That's the point that's being made here. It's reiterating something that was in a previous text. By the hearing process, as mentioned here and before, that's the previous verse, this realization of the presence of the Lord in the temple is made possible. As such, the first process in the routine work of devotional service, namely hearing, is the essential point. Hearing by all classes of devotees from the authentic sources like Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam is essential. The common man who is puffed up with his material position and does not bow down before the deity of the Lord in the temple or who devise, defies temple worship without any knowledge of the science must know that his so-called turban or crown, will only succeed in further drowning him in the water of the ocean of material existence. A drowning man with a heavy weight on his head is sure to go down more swiftly than those who have no heavy weight. A foolish, puffed-up man defies the science of God and says that God has no meaning for him. But when he is in the grip of God's law and caught by some disease like cerebral thrombosis, that godless man sinks into the ocean of nations by the weight of his material acquisition. Advancement of material science without God consciousness is a heavy load on the head of, a hum of human society and so, and so one must take heed of this great warning. Now Prabhupada would generally in his purports not name names but he would refer to a situation indirectly so was there some question was there some historical personality in India that was a celebrated VIP of some kind or another and died of cerebral thrombosis no not that you're aware of cerebral thrombosis Okay. He would do like that sometimes. <laughs> Not name a name, but, you know, somebody that's esteemed. But when, when the time of death came, that esteem didn't help them. Just a, a similar comment. One of the things that Prabhupada ran into when he was traveling and spreading Krishna consciousness in Europe, particularly in Germany, was there was a, the residual effect of a philosopher named Nietzsche. You heard his name before? Frederick Nietzsche? Frederick Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche was uh, an atheist. One of his favorite sayings is, God is dead. And one of the devotee prophet was commenting on this during one morning walk. And the devotee that was uh, the GBC member for Germany said, there's a big signboard, Nietzsche, God is dead. God, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> <laughs> so one may defy God or the existence of God. And, you know, he did a very thorough, harsh, biting criticism of theism and and people people who have conception of God. But in the end, he was subject to God's control. God is dead, but he's controlling everyone. God's not dead. Last paragraph. The common man, if he has no time to worship the Lord, may at least engage his hands for a few seconds in washing 
or sweeping the Lord's temple. For example, Maharaj Prataparudra, the great powerful king of Orissa, was always very busy with heavy state responsibilities, yet he made it a point to sweep the temple of Lord Jagannath at Puri once a year during the festival of the Lord. And it, it was a tradition, many familiar with Jagannath Puri, and the tradition where the king, when Jagannath would come out of the temple onto Jagannath's cart, the king would have a, a broom with a golden handle and would sweep before the deity as you know, to make way for the deity to proceed along the grand road heading from the temple to the Gundicha temple. I'll tell a little story. Story sometimes. See if I can recall the, the, the name of King Prataparudra's father. King Prataparudra's father. Forget his name. Um, made, an, made a marriage arrangement for the, the daughter of a king from South India to marry his son. So Prataparud was to be married. And the father, in, to, in, to honor the invitation of the father of the girl, to honor the invitation of Prataparudra's father, whose name I can't remember, he came to visit during Jagannath Rathyatra. And he was very surprised that he saw Prataparudra, the son, sweeping before the deity with his golden handle and the broom. And when he got back, he sent a messenger to the, 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 his father saying, my daughter's not going to marry a street, street sweeper. So the king, whose name I can't remember, was insulted. It, it, not just he was insulted, he was insulted, he was, Jagannath was insulted because he's not being honored as the, the Lord of, of all of us. So he, he got his entire army, gathered his entire army, and went to conquer that king who insulted Lord Jagannath and his son for sweeping before Lord Jagannath. And he was defeated. And he went back. And he prayed to Lord Jagannath, what happened? I went to defend your honor. And I was defeated. One of the priests asked him, before you went, did you take blessings from Lord Jagannath? <laughs> to represent him in that way. And so the king, whose name I can't remember, uh, Purushottam Dev, thank you. Purushottam Dev spent hours in the temple, prostrated before the deity, praying to the deity to protect his honor. And he then gathered his armies again and went a second time to this king in South India. On the way, the king and his armies stopped in a place outside of the capital to get some items at a, a, a place where they could get some pots and some thises and thats. And uh, when they got there, the, the merchant said, you don't have to pay anything. King said, how's that? He said, well, you had an advanced party. There was a, a very dark complexioned and a very white, fair complexioned soldier. They came in advance. They said, the king's army is coming. You take this jewel and, and give them whatever they want. And King Purushottam said, let me see that jewel. And it was the jewel of Lord Jagannath. 
And then he understood Jagannath and Balaram were the advance party. <laughs> and he was sure of victory, and sure enough, he was victorious. And the king submitted, the South India king submitted, and the daughter was then married to Prataparudra. So those who have faith, even with faith, they still are subordinate to the deity, Lord Jagannath included. So to be, in, to be a worshiper of the deity means to be a servant of the deity. And being the servant of the deity means you do and you don't do things that are uh, on behalf of and with the pleasure and mercy of the deity. That's how one lives. A life of devotion is like that. That's mentioned here. The idea is that however important a man one may be, he must accept the supremacy of the Lord. This God consciousness will help a man even in his material prosperity. Maharaj Prataparudra's subordination before Lord Jagannath made him a powerful king, so much so that even the great Patan in his time could not enter into Orissa on account of the powerful Mata Maharaj Prataparudra. And at last, Maharaj Prataparudra was graced by Lord Chaitanya on the grounds of his acceptance of subordination to the Lord of the universe. Now that has a nice story. The, the life of Lord Chaitanya has many biographies and one of them is the, the superlative biography amongst them all. Prabhupada made a translation of it. It's 17 volumes, sits on your bookshelf like this. Now they compressed it into fewer volumes, but it's a very outstanding biography. When Prataparudra, as a king, came to hear from his chief priest, his name was Sarva Bhoma, nice name for a chief priest. Um, that Lord Chaitanya is not just a sannyasi, but he's the personality of Godhead. And immediately, Sarva Bhoma, just saying that, Prataparuta had such regard for Sarva Bhoma, he said, I, I accept what you say. Can you make an arrangement so at least once I can meet with him? And the the, the Chief priest, Tarvabhoma, said, that's not easy. He's very strict. He doesn't meet with, world, meet with worldly people. You're a king. Likely he'll consider your position of being king to be a worldly position, worldly person. I'll try. But Chaitanya refused. There was a test. And there was a whole series of things that happened. Eventually, first he said, okay, well, you can send his son because the son is a representative of the father. So he sent his son. King Prataparudra sent his son. Lord Chaitanya gave his blessings to his son and then the father embraced his son. It was like embracing Lord Chaitanya. Then there was a whole other series of things that happened and one by one by one. The, the item that one, Lord Chaitanya's heart was his taking the position of humility directly before Lord Chaitanya with the golden handle broom and sweeping before Lord Jagannath. The plan was made by Sarvabhoma. When you do this, don't wear the king's attire, wear a simple man's attire, a simple Vaishnava's attire. Just be in the mood of a humble servant. When Lord Chaitanya sees that, you'll win his heart. And halfway through Rathyatra, commonly Jagannath cart stops. Lord Chaitanya will go into a garden called Jagannath Balab Garden. And he with his associates, because they've been dancing and dancing, they'll rest. When he's resting, you can recite some key verses from Srimad Bhagavatam and he'll be very pleased with you. Don't reveal your identity. Just recite verses from Srimad Bhagavatam. So he did. He began massaging Lord Chaitanya's feet. 
speaking nice verses from the Bhagavatam. Lord Chaitanya, without even looking at him on purpose, said, oh, you're my dearest friend. How can I possibly repay you? You're giving me messages of Krishna. I'm so indebted to you. So Prataparuja won Lord Chaitanya's favor by his humility, determination to get Lord Chaitanya's favor and reciting nice verses from Srimad Bhagavatam. The final section. Even though a rich man's wife has glittering bangles made of gold on her hands, she must engage herself in rendering service to the Lord. So worldly opulence is not something that attracts Krishna because he's Purushottama. He's the all opulent supreme person. So uh, uh, having opulence doesn't impress him. But humility and service impresses. So that's this Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevanam. Or back to the first part. Sarva, Upadi, Vinir Muktam. Leaving aside all designations, whatever that might be. On the, on the positive or negative side. I'm a poor person, I'm a rich person. I'm a smart person, I'm not so smart. I'm a this, I'm, I'm not. So wh whatever the upadi might be, you leave all those things aside and simply use your rishikas, your senses, in the service, the seva of rishikesh, with love, and that's bhakti. So that's what the teaching of uh, Canto 2, Chapter 3 is. And this little section, we just read one verse from the section. It's the material side where the senses are not used that way, and the spiritual side where the senses are used in that way. And when the senses are used in that way, with um, submission and love, then um, that's the beginning. And then the maturing from the beginning stage of bhakti. The rest of the chapter goes forward with a few more verses like that. And then Shukadeva Goswami starts drilling down more on what the besides what the body does, what the mind does, and then Sometime after what the mind does for the a life of devotion, what the heart does. And what there there is a, a phrase that that is repeated several times purposely, where there's a change of heart. So the idea is this practice or sadhana brings about the change of heart. Not the sadhana mechanically performed doesn't do the same thing. In other words, one doesn't become, uh, have a change of heart simply by making circles with incense and waving the, the incense in circles before the deity. That's a behavior, but it's the consciousness behind and behaviors that are authorized behaviors or, or activities combined with the hearing of transcendental messages that cleanse and purify the heart, bring about a change of heart. So it's the, the, what it, back to the question from to the, the end of chapter 19, and then I'm going to end here. Marsh Pikshit is about, he's cursed to die. And he's accepted. He's going to die in seven days. And the, 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 the form of death is a mystical thing. The, the young boy, Shringi, cursed him with a mantra that a snake bird, but there is no such thing as there are birds, and there's snake, but there's no, no snake birds. birds. Snakes don't fly. But a snake bird would come and bite him. I mean, it was so venomous, instantly his body would burst into flames. That's what happened. So he accepted, that's how I'm going to die in seven days. So how do I prepare myself? What's my duty? And the duty is devotional service. 
And how is that devotional service to be awakened? That's the other question. What is that subject matter that one should always hear, chant, remember, and worship? Shrotavya kirti tavyascha dyeya pujas chanityada. That's the question. So now that the subject matter has been identified and the mode of life has been identified and at the end of the 10th Canto Bhagavatam, hearing everything, because it's been a dialogue between the two, Maharaj Prikshit and Shukadeva, he tells Shukadeva, I'm ready. Let that snake, bird, whatever mystical thing sent by the Brahmin boy, let it come. I'm, my consciousness is fixed. He's ready to go back to Godhead. So that misfortune that was very surprising, unbecoming of him as a, as a very powerful and self-controlled king, to lose it, become angry and being un unable to control his thirst. It's not Maharaj Prikshit, but it happened. And the purpose was two things. So he could receive this whole Srimad Bhagavatam and so he could get a, a fast ticket, seven-day ticket back to Godhead. Fast-tracked. Now, it wasn't nice. Curse a king to die, a great personality. But there was a purpose. There was two purposes. And it was fulfilled. And the idea is, for us, the same opportunity is there. We don't know how long we're going to live. Maybe it's seven days. Maybe it's 70 years. Maybe it's whatever it is. Maybe seven moments. We don't know. And whatever it is, we're sure, one thing is sure it's going to happen. As sure as death, it's going to happen. So how do we prepare ourselves? From the material point of view, let's just take the people that are in this room right now. How many hours have we spent with our education? Preparing ourselves for a later stage of life. And the later stage of life is so that we're equipped to have a, a proper occupation. With a proper occupation, then the means to maintain ourselves and etc., etc. Lots of time, lots of energy, lots of very intense focus placed on preparing for that stage of life. Okay, great. Now, what about? the certainty that death is going to come. What, what's, that's the question. What should one do to prepare oneself for that certainty? And then what's the subject matter that one should hear, chant, and remember? So it doesn't mean don't prepare for your, your career and develop your career. It doesn't mean that. It means uh, that there's a, there's a, a, a more profound an ultimate mission of life, and that should be, that preparation should be made. The purpose, sva arta gatim, their purpose of life should be recognized, and investments of time and energy in that, which is our real ultimate self-interest. That's what the Bhagavatam is teaching us. So, Chapter 3, Pure Devotional Service, Change of Heart. It's almost 1 o'clock. Is that what? Is that clock right? No. Okay, it's, tw it's 20 minutes before the hour. See if there's some discussion. Now, the other evening, I, I, I came to, to Palatine on Wednesday evening. There was a family... That was really new. And we spent about, I don't know, a lot of time because they, one question and then another question and then I started asking, how about you, how about you? So I'll, I'll do that if you're not uncomfortable. Any, any comments or questions or reflections back on what we've discussed? Thank you, Mara. Uh as you mentioned that the education takes like 20 years probably 
start from say you are five years from kindergarten to to get a degree around 25 years or 26 years of age it would take like 20 years to do that so is there any so after 25 26 years at least you have a degree in your hand yeah so similarly after 25 years or 30 years in a spiritual life do you get any kind of degree or any guarantee or anything well, you get, a, you get a college degree, there's not a guarantee. Now that you get a piece of paper, but that, it depends whether it's favorable, unfavorable, etc. without going into all those statistics. Your question, though, however, is, is by spiritual investment, is there a guarantee? Well, the guarantee that we have is Krishna's words, is his promise. There are several promises made in Bhagavad Gita. Svalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahatobayat. Sva alpa means even a little. Even a little, little. Or in the language, the, the one is guaranteed what? One is guaranteed the greatest danger, the greatest mahabhaya, the greatest fear is what? According to the acharyas, the greatest fear is seeing the Yamadutas. Seeing the Yamadutas means down. So one will not see the Yamadutas, even if there's a little, 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 little. Sva Alpa. I just was hearing today, this morning, Prabhupada speaking of the three times a verse. Lesha is another. Just even if that's a small amount of mercy. Prasad Lesha. Small amount of mercy from the personality of Godhead. Then one is able to understand him. And without that even small amount of mercy, one may be very, 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 that's three varies, equipped in academic ca capacities. One won't be able to understand. And if one can understand, even with a little, that's pretty good because the, the little guarantees one, this is your, you know, what's the guarantee? The guarantee is by understanding Krishna's janma and karma. This is Bhagavad Gita. Janma karma chame divyam evam yoveti tatvataha. Tatvataha means in truth. Chakva deham punar janma. The one giving up chakva deha, when you give up this body, punar janma na. Liberation. No more, no more janmas. That's pretty good. Now that that the, the 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 requirement is to understand Krishna and truth, not just like check a box. I have a notional idea. Okay, there's my ticket. It's in understanding Krishna and truth, and to understand Krishna and truth, there's one method identified in Bhagavad Gita. That's the method is bhakti. So you, one becomes familiar with Bhagavad Gita and then the, the, the map, the picture of how to get the guarantee that you're asking about, it's there. Bhaktyamama bijanati yavanyas chasmi tattvataha. One can understand Krishna tattvataha through bhakti. Okay, so now I have to get some bhakti. Then I can understand Krishna tattvataha in truth and understand Krishna tattva in truth and punarjamana. No more birth. Boom, boom, boom. Sounds pretty simple. It is simple. But the, the difficulty, the difficulty is we're, we have a, a, a fair amount of attachments to things of this world, that, to the temporary, attachments to the temporary. Here's another verse from Bhagavad Gita. Really nice verse. 
Prabhupada spoke on the first verse of chapter 7 more than any other verse in the whole of Bhagavad Gita. I'm listening to a series of his, so far it's like 20th time he's spoken on chapter 7, text number 1. And the, the verse begins, Maya satta manak partha yogam yunjan barashaya then asam shayam without doubt samagram mam one can know me completely samagram mam yata gyas yashi tachunu and how the method is by tachunu is by hearing by hearing with faith then one can from the right source from Krishna then one can know Krishna in truth in full I mean, as much as the tiny can understand the unlimited, one can understand Krishna. He, he reveals himself to such a person who strives, strives to become attached, asakti, maya, sakta, mana, parta, the mind becoming attached to Krishna. Because the, the difficulty is we're attached to something. And often that something is the substitute. Not the transcendental attachment, but the attachment to the temporary. It's, it's, it's not that the temporary is to be trashed, but the temporary is temporary. And we engage with it, understanding that the purpose in relation to the Supreme. So that the, your question was, is there, what's the guarantee? Well, it's Krishna's word. And if one doesn't have faith in Krishna's word, then... There's no guarantee. Now, how do, what, how do I know that I, I can trust Krishna's word? Well, lots of people, that's right in Bhagavad Gita, Arjun says, great sages, he lists some of them, they've reached the stage of perfection by this very same method. So how do you know if you enroll in a college, you're going to get a degree? Well, lots of people enrolled in college and they've gotten their degrees. There's lots of people that have achieved spiritual progress so there's the precedent and there's Krishna's word. That's the guarantee. Supposing I don't have faith, then don't enroll in school. Or don't, don't engage oneself in spiritual life because I, there's no guarantee. But there is. There's precedent and there's Krishna's word. I give my word. Ma suchaha. Ma, don't, don't worry. Ma, suchaha. Well, I'm hesitant. Don't hesitate. Don't worry. I have no doubt. That, and Krishna keeps his word. What if I'm not qualified? It's okay. Krishna's kind and Krishna will keep his word. He'll, he'll help you become qualified. What's the qualification? It's not something material that the qualification is having a, having faith it's, and striving according to that faith and that faith will grow Krishna will help that does require the guarantee requires some faith in the, the precedent that went before me and in, in Krishna's words that's the guarantee And it's not like you need to carve out 20 years or 25 years. You, you go as you go along. You cultivate knowledge of Krishna or devotion to Krishna as you go along, step by step by step, from whatever point you begin. How old are you now? 12. 12. So you can start at 12. How old are you? 17. 17. You can start at 17. How old are you, Sadi Alamadava? Sixty. Sixty-five. Because he's been at it for a while. He's got a head start. So at any stage, it's right in Bhagavad Gita. At whatever point in time, one can begin. And then you'll accumulate some... Um, Relationship with Krishna, 
trust in Krishna, Krishna's confidence in you that you stay with it and he'll bestow. It's a relationship that you can really trust more than any relationship of this world that you can't have the same trust in because everything is temporary and imperfect. And Krishna is not temporary, nor is he imperfect. He gives his words, he keeps his word. Anything else? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I had uh, two questions from today's class and one from yesterday evenings. So, um, like when Parikshit Maharaj heard this uh, whole Bhagavatam in seven days, so he you you mentioned that he was completely ready. He said, "I am ready." So, my curiosity is like, what changes in the consciousness? What change in his consciousness? Because when I think about myself, I understand that death is certain, but the fear is how will it come? Will I be causing trouble or pain to others? In they, they will need to serve me or something, or I will need to suffer through a lot. I don't know. So fear is there. But yeah, so that's what my question is that what changed? in the consciousness of that person who hears Bhagavatam properly? <clears throat> Simple. Two things. Shelter in transcendence increases. Shelter in the impermanent decreases. Fear arises because of shelter in the impermanent, and it's impermanent. And so fear, fear is a byproduct of shelter in the impermanent. Fear arises from um, identification with that which is flickering and fleeting and here today, gone tomorrow. It's going to be gone. And it's fearful. When, how, what. But it's just, it's bayam dutiyam abhinivesi takshat. The, the, the language of the Bhagavatam, abhinivesi or absorption in um, the temporary, the asat, payam dvatiyam, means duality. You, 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 within this thing, within this material world, there's duality. Now it's daytime. Wait a while. It's going to be nighttime. It's summertime. Wait a while. It's going to be wintertime. Etc. This, wherever there is something in this world, there's its opposite. It's the place of duality. And when one is absorbed in the duality, that's not permanent. Fear arises. So the hadi got on the other side of fear. Get absorbed in that which is not dual, not that is not temporary. And that how to is described in the same verse. It's hearing, same message as this earlier section, hearing topics of transcendence or Bhagavad Gita 7.1, becoming attached, maya sakta manak parta, become attached to Krishna, become attached to that which is eternal. How? By sound. And where there's sound, it, attention goes or consciousness goes. Just like, for example, I can hear there's a fan, maybe it's an air conditioner or something. And if I would, didn't mention it, maybe we wouldn't even pay attention to it. But if I mention it, there's a sound. Air conditioning or fan or whatever it is. So uh, attention goes to where sound comes from. Prabhupada is giving a lecture at 26 Second Avenue, we were speaking about chanting and chanting audibly because when you chant audibly, then your attention goes to Krishna because the name and the person are not different. As he was saying that, a truck was going by on the street. 
And Prabhupada said, see, just like the trucks went by in the street, everyone's attention is going to the truck because it's really loud. You can't see the truck, but you can hear the truck, and attention goes to the sound of the truck because of the sound. So sound is it's like education. It's through sound. You don't just read books. You go and sit in classes and hear from a teacher, and you learn through sound. Sound is very important and very powerful. The how to go on the other side of fear is sound from the right source. Then dealing with the temporary things in a responsible way in relation to that which is eternal. You, that is accomplished by sound. And then fear subsides and confidence replaces the fear. It's like Sunil Amadava's question, what's the guarantee? You have a sense of connection through sound. You, that's where you're going. You're going from fear to the eternal. Thank you. Um, and uh, today in the purport, uh, Srila Prabhupada mentioned that second class discriminates. Therefore, they should do preaching work. So I couldn't understand. He, he said, that those who are in the topmost stage they don't differentiate. They see the soul only. I mean, they see bodies, but they see the soul and souls by nature. Souls by nature are eternally servants of God. So that's what they see. And then go down a notch. And those that are seeing, well, some souls are serving Krishna favorably, some unfavorably. So there's a differentiation. Now, such a person then reaches out to those who are not engaged favorably to help them engage favorably. And then he said, sometimes the persons in this upper stage, they come into the world and they do preaching work or giving you know, reminders to people who have forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. So um, last evening... Uh, my like I had a, like understanding about something uh, overlap and time. So you kindly mentioned that uh, I may uh, we need to exercise caution here. So I was just contemplating about it, Maharaj. That even when we think favorably about Krishna, sometimes but we still need to exercise caution. So. Uh, what is the reason for that, even if we are thinking favorably? Well, I'm not sure the context of what you're referring to. I'm sure that our guests here are also unaware of the context. But a standard kind of caution Prabhupada would use is uh, the, when you have a razor, of course now they have safety razors, it's pretty safe. But before there was safety razors, it's a sharp instrument, it has some use. But when you're using that sharp instrument, you have to be careful. Because you, otherwise you can cut yourself and there's blood all over the place. So you use a good instrument, still you have to be cautious. Inattentiveness can make a mess when using something that's very effective. Remain attentive, be cautious. Stay attentive. It was like a car or something that's, you know, that can do a lot of stuff. You have to get a computer. You can do a lot of stuff. Be cautious because it can, it can, not properly used, it can, can it, there's all kinds of contamination op options for people who don't use it properly. So be cautious. So since I was saying something which didn't have any reference, so that is also like that. Will... It depends. Oh. <laughs> it depends. Why I was thinking about it because then I was mapping it to my even day to day activities while I'm serving. Because many times I just take decisions um, like 
maybe eyeballing something or you know just maybe we are rushing and the offering time is limited and we just offer for five minutes so then it just feels scary that okay is it spontaneous or am i doing right or no then it it is translating to every activity <laughs> same answer it depends i mean you know the, the 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 deity who you're making the offering to will understand your circumstance and if your circumstance is such that it's not just whimsical but it's actually the the force of circumstance your kids have to run off to school you have to make the offering so you make the offering and then you remove the offering you have to be practical so it it, it depends on your your is it mechanical or is it devotional it depends circumstance may dictate one or the other or identify one or the other thank you very much how about our host family anything i have a simple question okay if we do devotion in this like in this uh, hold it closer uh then it will omit our past lives karma yes two things two things one is past karma is sig- significantly reduced and second is the spiritual merit will stay with you beyond this life here's a very simple example supposing you put money in a bank at the end of life it's gone supposing you put something in a spiritual bank account at the end of life it's there you did 5% so your next life you start at 6% spiritual activity has a permanent asset and the other question you asked is are your past karmas eradicated or reduced yes bhakti has that power so so we need not worry we need that and focus our attention on what's back there we focus our attention of what's in front of us there may be some things that happen in your life that have something to do with what's back there but what's back there the karma from the past according to the the the, the scripture the karma that we we should have otherwise received is minimized like anything it's just rather a token reminder of something that's back there and not proportionate to or any past misdeeds supposing someone should have gotten a broken arm instead they get a scratch on their arm just a token reminder there's something back there so be careful But yes karma is is um significantly reduced or it's another another energy of krishna is at play in the life of a devotee that's the internal potency and it overrules the external potency the maya potency the karma potency Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh the question is like um what is the motivation I can hold on to be determined and motivated in spiritual practice? Faith. Faith that's nourished by good association. Adav shraddha tatha sadhu sanga. So the starting the 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 the, sp- the springboard the diving board is 
the the starting point is preliminary faith. We can hold on to that and develop it further or nourish it further by sadhu sangha. And then it can, faith can grow. So that's the starting point and yet something you can hold on to. Intrinsic within every living entity, ourselves certainly as devotees, there's some faith in the existence of a higher reality. Nourished through sadhu sangha, and then that faith grows. So that's something you can hold on to. And the, and the good association, hold on to it. Next. I have one more question, Maharaj. Um, this is a um, confusion part, actually. Like, um, even on the material side, for example, I have to do the daily fitness, or otherwise I have to do my uh, studies to do my project better. Right, so that is on the material side. Even there, I'm lazy sometime, or I'm not determined to do it, so I'm failing on the material side. But that is, I'm able to understand. In spiritual, if I'm failing, a lot of question comes to my mind. Like um, example is like, what like I do not have the mercy, or I have a lot of anathas or I committed some offenses because of that this is happening. Like that, so many questions come to my mind. If it's material, I didn't do it because it is like this. But it, when spiritual, if I'm not able to do it, there are a lot of things comes to my mind. So I, yeah, that's the confusion part. So Why and what to do? Yeah, how to take it nicely so that I can move forward. Uh, not being in the oh, confused the, the, state. The why is the distraction of the mind, and what to do is back to your first question. Something that you can rely, you just hit, you hit the reset button. Factory reset. <laughs> now it goes back to square one. Okay. Who am I? What's important in life? What's my mission in life? What's the means to help further in steps towards that mission in life? So you, you have you have a, a the, 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 those X Y Z so many thoughts. You have a parking lot. You put them over there. You know where do you want to go? Who are you and where do you want to go? And you know invigorate who you are. The concepts of self. Know yourself and your mission in life. And then go there. The other is the mind dragging you away from Krishna. Self-doubt, etc., etc., etc. Supposing you could identify the cause, so what? Then you still are left with where, who are you, where are you going to go? And when you, when you start going further with who you are and where you want to go, the parking lot empties out. Say it conversely. Don't do the positive and you're just going to get consumed by distractions. You, you, know, you get further controlled by the mind where your mind becomes the greatest enemy, not your best friend like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so someone else? Hey, Krishna Prabhuji, uh, this might be a very basic question. It's okay, um, we're ready. <laughs> but uh, why 16 rounds? What is this magic number 16? And why is it better to do just four rounds of very uh, very conscious and uh, dedicated chanting rather than doing 16 rounds. Yeah, it, it, The magic number is because, there's several parts to your question. The magic number is because our founder Acharya assessed that that's what his young Western disciples could manage. It started with a higher number. 
And then it went down to half of that. And then it went down to half of that. I said, but that's minimum. So that's the, how the magic number came up. And he found that the, the commitment could be maintained. You know, it, it, commitments take commitment to maintain, but it, it, it's maintainable. Now, then it was 16 minimum. There are devotees that are accustomed to much more than 16 minimum. You know, the, it's, then it's spontaneous, it's voluntary. It's not like I just do the minimum and that's it. So that's where the magic number comes from. There's a, there's a, Sham Sundar in Houston, temple president in Houston is no longer the president. He's about your age. And uh, so he's some younger person is the president. And he, what he does is every codice by eight o'clock in the morning is 64 rounds. And he's got a team of people with him that are tagging along, holding on to his dhoti and they're going along with 64 rounds by eight o'clock in the morning. And then it's, you know, and then more. So he's like turbo. But, you know, that it's those that like the turbo mode, they're, they're happy to be with him. But 16 is like people are busy and they've got their jobs and their families and their thises and their thats and they're 16. So, and then is it better, you know, it, it, it's a false dilemma or false option, four good ones versus 16 not good ones. You know, not 16 good ones. If you can do four good ones, you, why not 16 good ones? It's, it's, a, it's an artificial uh, dichotomy. So do good ones, however many you can do. Do good ones. And then strive, if you're not there yet, to make it 16 minimum. And then when yeah, you maintain that, then you make it your 64 minimum or whatever, your 25 minimum or whatever is, is minimum. One of my god brothers uh, visiting in Alachua, we, we did lots and lots and lots of service together. He's now, um, long story, but he's now no longer in GBC service. His wife has Parkinson's disease and he spends a lot of time taking care of her. And they're very wonderful devotees. So he told me, private, I don't share this with anyone, but every year I'm increasing by two rounds. And I have a target of when I'll be up to 64. He gave me the number that he's chanting every day now. You know, it's just like that's spontaneous on his side. I, that's something I can maintain. And on Akata sees he does a little more, but, you know, this is something every day, every day, every day. You know, according to life circumstance and focus and... So according to your life circumstance and your focus, but you know, take take a number that you can maintain and do them nicely. You know, do them nicely means a lot of things. But we, you know, with with attention, with absorption, or asakti maya sakta mana, and then as many, then strive for that standard of sixteen. That's what Prabhupada. And we follow what he did for those who are initiated devotees. Some initiated devotees, they're already more than 16. Okay. Uh, one more related question. Um, so I'm not, uh, I mean, I have two kids and uh, I'm not at a point where I can like, you know, stop cooking onion and garlic because a lot of my kids, the food that they like or they're picky, so I cannot like totally get rid of uh, all that in my house right now. So is it, I feel like offering when I make food. So is it better to offer if I put onion and garlic in the food or I should not offer? You should not. You should not offer. What you can do for the family members that like that, you cook for them and you don't offer. And then over there you have separate pots and you cook for, for Krishna and you cook things that you can offer to Krishna and offer those things to Krishna. 
Now, in, it, depending upon the family members, if you can wean them slowly, then that's ideal. That would be better than just shrugging shoulders. But if not, if they're not ready to, to go there, then you continue. But you can't, you can, you, you, if you offer something to Krishna that's not acceptable, he's not going to accept it. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhupada. Mm. I have a question. Um, like in the material life, we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities at home yes. uh, for children, um, basic responsibilities. Lots of stuff. Right? Yeah, and then at work, we have tasks, right? So we we constantly have certain tasks that are deliverable at a certain due date, so we are consumed by that. Yes. And then kids have events that we have to take them to or their practices or we are consumed by that. So during this normal day, uh, I mean, in the morning we pray, we chant rounds. In the evening we pray, we chant rounds. And then we offer food, we pray. So those are the only connections that I have. But how can we cultivate the habit that during our normal day, across all these tasks and deliverables we do for home or for work or for whatever else, how can we cultivate the habit to kind of remember and connect with Krishna? Great question. I, I, I can give, you know, I'll give a simple answer. It may sound too simple or over simple, and therefore not satisfying. But, but I'll give it anyways. In in a something similar to her question, if if you if if, or to the proportionate to your absorption in the devotional activity, connecting with Krishna as a person that will carry over, spill over, expand the concentric circles out into all the other activities of your day. The, the uh, attachment to Krishna, maya saktamana, the attachment to Krishna done properly in your, that whatever that time is that you have devotional um, designated time, that energy then carries over to the other activities. Naturally. Very simple. Really simple. Um, you know, your, your, that your attachment to your family members. Natural. Your wife and your daughter. You have attachment. So, so even when you're at work and you're doing tasks, naturally because of attachment, thoughts will go to them. So if attachment can be energized in relation to Krishna, he's at the center of everything, that energy, that attachment, that bhakti shakti, will be there with you when you're doing your work. So the material conception is, I'm working for my boss. The spiritual conception is, I'm working for Krishna. The boss thinks I'm working for him. That's okay. I'm working for Krishna. And my success will be in getting the tasks done in a timely fashion, in a quality way, will be by gifts given by Krishna, not by my boss. Krishna can enable anyone to do anything in the workplace or in the home or anywhere. The ability in man is Krishna. So that if I energize my Krishna connection, I'll do better at work, and I'll be mindful of Krishna. Maya Sakta Mana, 7-1 Bhagavad Gita. Read it, appreciate what's there. Then the, what he explains is also an answer to your question. He said, how that can be done, I'm going to explain. That's chapter 7. It's the how-to chapter. 
which is what your question is. Because he says earlier in Bhagavad Gita, perform your prescribed duty and always think of me. He says to Arjun, Mama Nusmara Yudhya Cha. Yudhya, in his case, is fighting. Yudhya. So Prabhupada translates that as uh, Mama Nusmara, always think of me and engage in your prescribed duty. So engage in your prescribed duty and always think of me, which is what your question, how do I and always think of him, is by coming attached to him. You think of those who you are attached to. Young boy, young girl, have romance. He thinks of her. She thinks of him. No one has to tell them. Think of her. Think of him. Because that's just how the world is. When you That which you're attached to, you think of. As the attachment to Krishna grows from that portion of your day that's designated devotional time, as that not just mechanically, but genuinely, the sense of connection with Krishna and attachment to Krishna grows. Your thoughts go to Krishna in the workplace, in the home, when taking your kids to their practices, as you said, and you know, helping them through their the stuff that they have to go through growing up and being teenagers in modern world. It's like you know, it's time consuming, but it's it's okay because it's there's affection. And that you'll be better at that the more your attention is with Krishna. The solution to material problems is the spiritual solution. When the spiritual connection is strong, the material obstacles become more easily addressed. And one who has that faith, so that's 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 the how-to. It starts with that nice time that you have in doing, in doing in a qualitative, qualitative way, whether there's four rounds or 16 rounds or 64 rounds or whatever it is. And then you always want to quant quantitatively and qualitatively improve. And as that grows, then you'll be better at all the other things. Materially speaking even, what to speak of consciousness speaking. Okay. Thank you. We have one other family member to invite to say something. You know, her daughter. Anything? Um, I have a question, Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. So um, I was thinking, um, even when it comes to chanting, is there like a difference you feel after like a numerous number of days or weeks that you chant every day? Or what did you feel like um, after you first started chanting? Like, was there a difference in your life? Or? Me? Yeah. Or like in general, do people feel any change? And if so, like how how do you feel that? Or like what happens? Well, I'll give a little autobiographical sketch. Um, once upon a time, as a college kid, I the, the light went on. A light went on that was there for when I was little, but I didn't get answers. So I kind of like just, you know, stopped asking the questions and got busy with being successful, which is what you're supposed to do. I was good at trying to be successful. Then a little light went on that said, wait a minute. There's a higher reality. I mean, I'm making it short. Three things. There's, there must be a place where people aren't with each other like people today are with each other. There must be a place where people are more human. There must be a place where people feel like I feel. Like, why is this inhumanity of man to man? It doesn't make sense. There must be a place where there's people that aren't like that, and I want to find that place. A very idealistic kid, young man. So it was three things. There's a high reality. I know that I don't know what it is. And I want to know. So I was on a quest. And many things, and of the many things, chanting resonated. I mean, there was like, that took about eight months. But there was doing so many different things. Because I wanted to know. And when I started chanting, I, like, 
I was chanting four rounds. And I was hearing 16. I was thinking, wow, I'm in pre-med. I don't have time. But I kept hearing it. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So here's what happened. It's, it's in responsive to your question. It, to chant 16 rounds took me two hours. That was a lot of time for, you know, a pre-med student, but I did it. And what I found was, by chanting 16 rounds instead of four, the amount of sleep I required reduced by two hours. I didn't try to reduce my sleep. It's just I was energized, and the sleep requirement was less. And then I did my studies after I did my 16 rounds, and it was, I accomplished the academic work in less time because I was more concentrated. And then I had time to read Bhagavad Gita because they had more time within a busy day. That was my subjective experience. And some other things happened, but that was, that was a little autobiographical snippet. And, uh, you know, different persons have different experience. Certainly more clarity, more focus, more freedom, more, more freedom of consciousness, not necessarily more freedom of time, but more freedom of consciousness. You know, my ability to make decisions based upon who I really am as opposed to pressures that are weighing on me became much more strong. And you know, young people, being who you are is a big deal, but then figuring out who you are, that's a big deal too. So I had much more clarity about who I am and had the freedom rather than pressure, peer pressure, parental pressure, you know, worldly expectation pressure. I had freedom. I felt it. And then when, when, when the choices were more me instead of expectations on me, my heart was there. So it was, it was more energized just from that one thing. I, you know, the, 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 the starting point was I was doing uh, maybe 15 different things, you know, on the strength of I want to know. And I found of those things, this was most effective without going through the, the weeding things out. So then when I started, then I worked up to four rounds, then it was like, okay, with a six, magic 16 number. What about that one? <laughs> so it's going to be different for different people, but that's what happened with me. Something? You want to add? Yeah. And also another question is, how do you know like what good associ is, association is versus bad? Like, Let's say you go to the temple and do some service with your family or friends, and then after that, um, you go up to prayer or whatnot, and then you see the same people you were doing the devotion with, they talk behind your back, but then you just go off like you ignore that. Then how do you know who to keep in good can't contact with a good association versus bad? Well, that's a nice question too, because there's all there's all different colors out there of in the spectrum of good and more good and less good and deceptive and cosmetic people and genuine people. So a good part of that, I would say three things. One is good old intuition, super soul inspiring you. The second is your own purification so that your lens that you're looking through is clearer because let, our lenses are also colored. How we're looking at things is not so transparent. We're looking at things that resonate with us and that's good because it resonates with us rather than necessarily what's good. And then a third is um, become a little more familiar with Bhagavad Gita because in Bhagavad Gita, it's, it's, you know, it's, the definitions are there of mode of goodness, mode of passion, mode of ignorance, what are the symptoms? And good association is 
more in the direction of goodness. So what are the symptoms? What are the symptoms of passion and ignorance? So you can look through the lens of Scripture. Back to the second one is become a little more purified so the, the lens that you're looking through, even looking through the lens of Scripture, is clearer. And then the good old super soul prompting. This is good. This is wholesome. Persons who are, you know, a real big one is persons who are truthful and humble. We had this discussion in a group of young Western kids on this very topic. How do you know who's what's wholesome? When there's um, someone is respectful, consistently respectful, not cosmetically, but consistently respectful. And when they say something, they do something. They keep their word. They're honest. Those are two very important mode of goodness considerations and you watch over time and you can see wholesome is it will have those two qualities. So, so be like that yourself as, be, as much as you can and, and keep that kind of association as much as you can. Be respectful to everybody but keep close association with people like, that are like that. They're consistently respectful. They're not disrespectful to others snotty, looking down their nose and criticizing and fault-finding and talking behind people's back and saying one thing and doing another thing. So that's like, it happens, but, you know, away from that as much as you can for association. They're respectful. And that means, you know, with that is they're humble. They have, their regard for the self is not inflated. And they give their word, they keep their word. Okay, I think we're good. Do you want to say anything? Are you sure? Okay. Bring your drum next time. Okay. See the Prabhupada key.